Hi everyone, so glad you're here on this uh, Memorial Day. Thanks for joining us here at jamplay.com. We are in session number five and we're talking about the most comfortable scale around, the minor pentatonic scale. And there's so much to say about that scale that we need eight, to eight uh, sessions to cover it. So we're in session five. If you're just joining us, that's great, welcome. Don't feel like you have to go back and rewatch the previous ones uh, right now. After, you can, but right now, just stick around. They'll, they'll, there should be some things for you, too. And um, I want to remind you that uh, these sessions are being recorded. If you're a member of jamplay.com, you can go back on the website and rewatch them as much as you want. You can download the supplemental content, the charts, the backing tracks, all the different things we're going to use throughout this session. And uh, today, we are combining everything we've talked about in the previous four sections, and we're going to take a look at different types of positions of slices of the fretboard. And that's how I want you to see those positions. A lot of players kind of get stuck on the actual positions, thinking, I need to play position four because it sounds different than position three, and they kind of clutter their minds with positions. I don't want you to do that. Because eventually, the main goal of these sessions is to break free from thinking in terms of positions and shapes and just taking control over your instrument, just like a singer would. It's exactly the same thing. When a singer sings something, he kind of hears it inside and sings it without thinking about the, the shape of his throat, his mouth, and, and his tongue. You don't think about it even when you're talking, and that's kind of what we're going towards. But before doing that, we need to uh, take a look at some of these positions, some of the key positions that uh, are going to be the building blocks for basically speaking musically freely on the instrument. So that's where we are, we're at today. We covered the main positions, and there are five positions, and positions are just slices of the fretboard. Because if I took a minor pentatonic scale, which is a five note scale, so we simply have five notes. One, two, three, four, five, if I'm in the key of A. And on the guitar, there are multiple places I could play an A. These two notes, for example, on the low E string, fifth fret, and the open string, fifth string, sound exactly the same. So if I were to map out on this big fretboard, put a dot anytime I have one of these five notes, I'd have a lot of dots. It would cover the full fretboard. And to make it easier to memorize, we slice our fretboard into five positions that are, that are equally accessible. They're not too difficult to, to play in the sense that there are no stretches. But those positions, those slices of the fretboard, are really proper to guitar players. If you ask a piano player to play in position two, it really wouldn't make any sense for him because it's a different instrument. And the slices on a piano would be different than the ones on a guitar. So positions are only used to memorize the fretboard, to make it simpler to memorize. It's not a way to sound different um, using position three instead of position one is, in essence, sounding the same. It's going to give you the same type of flavor because we're playing the same exact five notes over and over. So that's what we covered in the previous sessions. Today, we're going to take a look at the full fretboard, all these positions combined, and we're going to make a new type of position, something a little different by combining several sections together. So far, the positions were vertical positions. So if you take a, a small slice of the fretboard, for example, between frets five and eight, that's one slice, that is position number one. And that's a vertical position because it goes from, um, from the, the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. It's not horizontal. A horizontal position covers a lot of different frets. A vertical position is narrow and it's reachable without having big extensions. You don't have to really extend your fingers like that. 
it's all reachable within um, uh, within your muscles like that. So today we're going to combine several of these positions together to create a horizontal position instead of a vertical one. So I'm going to show you the chart. There's only one today, very simple, but we're going to use that to come up with other ways of playing that scale. So on this chart, we, you have all the possible notes for an A minor pentatonic. And there are only five notes. If you look at the names of these notes, we have R, which is the red note. That's the root. That's the reference point. In this case, it's A because we decided to play an A. So on the low E string, fifth fret, you have a root. And you have other roots on the fretboard. Those roots have the same um, note name. So these are A's. They're higher A's, but they're all A's. Okay? So all the red notes are A's, are roots. Then we have a flat third or a minor third. It's the same thing. There's a lot of flat thirds on the fretboard, but if we were to play them one after the other, they were the same exact notes. Some are higher, but same note, though. Um, and we'd, we'd see that we just have five notes. Roots, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor seventh, and root. In application, what that means is that if I had a, a backing track that I'm going to create, you don't see it, but on the bottom on the floor here, I've got a looper pedal. And um, I'm just going to create a simple loop. I'm going to use a lot of A's because all the notes that I'm going to play are going to be attracted to that A, and that's what creates the color of the music. So I'm going to create a simple loop here. I might add a chord after that, but I'll start with the bass. That's going to go on. I'll add a few chords. Okay, I've got a loop going on. Any note that I play is going to be attracted to that backing track in the back. So if we go back to the full chart that we had, don't pay attention to the colored notes or the non-colored notes. I'm going to play any of these notes. They're going to work because it's in the same key. Everything works, right? No matter which position I'm playing in. Because that works, that means that I could make up, come on, stop, okay, I can make up a position, a shape, by just taking random notes from there and they're going to work because they're part of the same scale. And if you look at the colored notes, this is called a sliding position because at some point we're going to slide. And you'll see that there's some kind of uh, logic, um, repetition in there. Take a look at... The first, um, the first five notes. I've got the root on the low E string, fifth fret. And I'm going to play that with a ring finger, followed by, on the fifth string, frets three, five, seven. And for that, that's where the slide happens. I'm going to play a ring finger. And then these three notes on the fifth string are going to be index, ring, and that ring is going to slide to the next note. So that perfect fourth slides to the perfect fifth. So I'm only using two fingers. I'm using ring, index, ring, and ring again, sliding there. On the next string, I've got index for the minor seventh. In that shape alone, covers the five notes of the minor pentatonic scale. One, two, three, four, five. And then I can repeat that. On all the other strings. And that's the sliding pentatonic scale. And you can kind of see the, the logic. 
imagine that on the low E string, instead of starting with a root, which is the ring, we're starting with the index. Imagine that we're starting with the minor seventh. Now we'd have index, ring, index, ring, ring. Okay? Index, ring, index, ring. Just practice that for a little while. There are five notes. You're starting with the minor seventh. Now that shape that we're playing, index, ring, index, ring, slide, can be reproduced exactly on the next string. But instead of starting with the index on the third fret, we're starting an octave higher on the fifth fret. Same exact shape. And then we can do the same exact shape, this time on the second string eighth fret. And now we have the minor pentatonic scale played three times across three octaves, three pairs of strings. And I should probably have colored that minor seventh, but I didn't want to confuse people by starting the color on a note that is not the root. But that position can be started with any note of the scale. It's not the note you start from that determines the color, but it's the attraction of the notes you're playing with the backing track that creates that color. So if we go back to our loop, and I play those notes, whether I start with the red note, or the minor seventh, it's, it, it has the same color. That's what's important. So that's why I could start with that minor seventh. And if I play that full sliding scale, this is what I'll have. Slide. Slide. And that's a valid option. I'm picking notes from the big scale to make a new type of shape. That combines several shapes together. That's what we're doing. Let's try it again. Remember, we're only using two fingers. Index, ring. Index, ring. Index, ring. Ring again. Index, ring. Index, ring. Ring. Index, ring. Index, ring. Ring. So the formula is index, ring, index, ring, slide. Index, ring, index, ring, slide. Just remember that. Let's try that again. We're going to very slow pace. Let's try that again. Let's try it together. So if you have a guitar, um, which I hope you do, we're going to try it together. This is our beat. Play one note per beat. Three. try it descending. The descending motion also involves the same exact fingers, but the slide is going to change. Instead of sli sliding with a ring, do you have a question? We just have a real quick question yeah. actually about exactly what you're playing, so I wanted cool. to get it before we moved on. Yeah. Um, it's from Woody Bang. He says, are you sliding on that third note on the string for color instead of just using your pinky? Yeah, yeah. You could use the, definitely. Well, for color and also for simplicity. Because if you use your pinky, so that would be index, ring, index, ring, pinky, index, ring, index, ring, pinky. Between, when, when you're shifting octaves after the pinky, you're going to have to shift your full wrist like that, a full movement like that. Whereas if you're doing the slide, the slide takes care of the shift automatically and is smoother that way. But definitely nobody's going to um, punish you because you're using that pinky. It's a different sound. 
Uh, if that's the sound you have in your mind, then you do that. That's totally fine. But yeah, we're using it in a sliding way here just for exploration of the fretboard. That's a good question. Um, and yeah, I forgot to mention this is interactive, so if you have questions like that, don't hesitate. Ask them, and, and Jeff will interrupt me, and we'll, that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to descend that position now. Um, we're going to start at the very last note, which is the perfect fifth on the first string. Twelfth fret, we're out with the ring, right? And when we we're ascending, the perfect fourth was with the ring too, because we played that ring and then slid, or slided, slid, slid. Did that slide with the ring. When we descend, we're going to do ring, index, and the index is going to slide. So this time there's more index, uh, indexes than rings. Ring, index, slide, ring, index. Ring, index, slide, ring, index, and so forth. When we ascend, the more ring fingers. Okay, so we're going to try both ways. We're going to ascend and descend. Let's try it without the, the track for now. So remember, we're starting with the flat seven so that we have consistency of five notes on each pairs of strings. On the first string, we have two notes. On the next, we have two and the slide. Okay. So let's give that a try. One note per beat. Two, three, four. Very slow. We're anticipating the next note, the slide. Second string and slide. Repeat that note and descend. Slide is with the index. Third string, slide, ring, index, ring. Okay, let's try that a little bit uh, faster with the track this time. That's our beat. We're gonna try two notes per beat. So instead of that, we'll have three and four. And Descend. realized that I, I didn't really talk about that slide much. There's several ways to do it, but the way that, I, that I'm playing in here is strike a note, strike another one, another one, another one. So I'm on the fifth string, fourth, um, perfect fourth, which is the fifth fret. And before doing that slide, I strike that string one more time with the pick. Because if I don't, That last note is not as loud as the others. It's not. It's okay, but that's not how I did it. <laughs> you can do it that way if you want. It has a different type of sound, but I just wanted to point that out. So without doing five, five uh, plucks like that with your, your pick, it would sound like this. The goal here, by with using this, is to see that we can combine several positions together to create a new position. When you're playing, I don't want you to just think that, well, that's a brand new position, and I'm just going to improvise using that. That's good. Because if you do, you're going to be limited. 
at some point or another. What I want you to think of is that I'm coming from this area of the fretboard. And every once in a while, ask yourself, which um, vertical position are you in? For example, after that slide, you're in position number one. And maybe continue in position one. Try to extract from that zone of the fretboard different ideas. And when you're tired of those ideas, rely on that sliding position to, to shift to a different position. So it, the only way to do that is to spend time with it and have your charts in front of you. You can print them out, you can um, memorize them, but that's the only way. It's not going to come just like that. That doesn't mean that it's very hard to do or that it takes a long time to get there, but that's the only way to do it. Just Slow down your playing. Don't feel like you have to create something super melodic at first. Just slow it down and just ask yourself the question, where am I when I'm using that sliding position? And then land on a note and go back to your chart and see where that note falls within these vertical positions. Okay. Um, I think it would be good to remind ourselves of what we talked about last week also, about those positions. Last week we learned the last position, the fifth one, or actually it was position number four, but it was the fifth position we learned. And I kind of took a, a, a shortcut um, in the lesson and, and talked about the caged system a little bit. And I know a lot of people talk about it because it's such a great system and it can be used here to make sense of your fretboard. So I just want to remind you a little bit, I'm not going to talk much about it, but quickly remind you of um, what that caged system is. Caged spells out C-A-G-E-D, five letters, chords. Those chords are the open chords, the open C chord, the open A, the open G, open E, open D. And the idea with a caged system is not to fit anything within these open chords. That's not the idea. But the idea is to, to look at these five chord shapes, the open shapes, so C, um, A, G, E, D, and extract from these open shapes some characteristics. And these characteristics are going to be found in any other musical elements. So what do I mean by characteristics? There are two things that we're looking at that we're extracting from these characteristics. The first thing that we're looking at is where is the root? Which string is the root on? For C, for example, the C, open C, the root is on the fifth string. So that's the first half of that characteristic. The second half is where is the chord built according to my root. So if the root is in the fifth string for C, and when you're looking at your guitar, not when you're looking at mine, but when I'm looking at mine, from my perspective, from a player's perspective, is the rest of the chord built on the right side or the left side? In this case, it's on the left side. And that's what you're looking at as far as the characteristics. Each of these five chords, C, A, G, E, D, you will have different characteristics. The root's gonna be on different, different strings and the placement of the chord is gonna be either left or right. You're never gonna find the same exact two characteristics in one of these chords. And we'll see that we can apply those characteristics to anything on the instrument. And to go back to our topic, the pentatonic scales, we have five positions and we'll see that each of these positions fits one of these characteristics. The C characteristic, the A, G, E, D. And that's what we did last week. And I wanted to remind you of that because that's maybe going to help you when you're trying to blend the sliding pentatonic scales. 
Oops. With the vertical positions, that's going to help you. Just ask yourself which characteristic of these of this position am I using? Is it the C A G E D? In other words, where is the root, and in which um, direction is my scale built? If it doesn't make sense, don't worry. This is being recorded. You can rewatch it. You can rewind it. And with the charts, it's going to make sense more. And if you watch this in com combination with the previous lesson, last week's lesson, it's going to make much more sense. So that's what we're after today. Hey, Dave, before we move on, yeah. do we have a minute for a couple questions? Yeah, I love it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Seemed like that was a good stopping point. This question is a little overdue, but there just wasn't a good point to ask. Um, Greg GP says, I'm working from the archives. I have yet to do number four. Does it matter if I jump and do number five live? Um, no, it doesn't matter at all. I'm glad you're here. Just stay here and um, just watch number four later. That's great. Okay. And then there's one more question from uh, David Mafra. Does memorizing all the root notes of the scale and starting the scale can help me from get out of the scale shapes? Ideas? Uh, yeah. Um, so you don't. I don't think you have to learn all the roots necessarily. But what I would do is know the roots on the low E string and the fifth string. So just two strings to learn. And then you'll see that, let, let's, let's do it in A, because we're in A, okay? We got A on the low E string, fifth fret. That's on the sixth string. So you know that root, and from that root, you can build the position that's on the right side and on the left side. Respectively, let's position one and position five. The position numbers, one, two, three, four, five, correspond to the first note of that position. The first note of the minor pentatonic is the first position. The second note is the second position. If you're starting that position with the second note, that's position number two. There are as uh, there's the same number of positions as there are number of notes in the scale. So if you're dealing with a seven note scale, there's seven positions. An eight note scale, eight positions, and so forth. So the question was, should you learn all the roots? No, just learn, I, I don't think so. I think just learn the, the ones on the low E string and the fifth, because from the one on the low E string, you can build position one, five, that's two positions out of five. Um, the root on the fifth string is going to correspond to positions four on the right side. So if you're in A, that's 12th fret. And position three, which is on the left side. And again, all you needed is uh, the root on the low E string and the fifth. In the position that's missing, that's position number two, in order to find it, you're still using your knowledge of the root on the low E string, which is fifth fret, and you find the octave, which is two strings above and two frets above. And that'll be the starting position of number two. So you don't need to memorize all the roots, just the ones on the low E string and the fifth, and you should be okay. Okay, all the other questions are kind of general, so... Um, okay. Well, actually, they're hard. this one might actually be... This should only take a second. Um, it's from Woody Bang, and he says, I've heard that George Harrison's solo on Let It Be follows what you are teaching in this lesson. Is that true? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't have the song in my mind, but... Um, I'm pretty sure it does. <laughs> pretty much anything really can fit that topic anyways. The only difference is that, so this is purely pentatonic scale. Sometimes um, you can have more complex scales, but within these more complex scales, you're always, 99% of the time, going to find a hidden pentatonic scale. So in essence, you could fit that to any solos that you're hearing. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, all right, thank you very much for your questions.
and keep them coming. That's great. I would like now to uh, go through a few examples, a few licks. Those licks are tabbed out for you, so you can you can find them on the site in the supplemental content if you're a member of Jamplay, and um, if not, you should be. But there are three examples here that use part of that sliding pentatonic scale, and we're going to go through them. The first one is uh, in triplets, triplets three notes per beat. So if this is our tempo, if we go back to our loop here. Not that chord actually. Well, no, I don't know how. <laughs> so I'll leave the chord going on. But if that's our tempo, three notes per beat. I'm gonna play three notes each beat. It'll be that kind of rhythm feel. So that's for the rhythm. We only have triplets. Now let's look at the notes, and these notes are going to make sense because you know that position, that sliding position. We are starting, let's look at the first three notes, with a root, so ring, index, and ring. Five, three, five. Okay, the logic, there's always a logic that we can extract from an idea. In this case, the logic was we play a note, play the note below, and play the first note again. So first note, the note just before, and first note again. We're going to use that logic throughout the lick. So play a note, play the note just before, and play the note again. We're going to use this, but this time we will use it from the fifth string, third fret. So play the note, play the note just before, and play that note again. And then we'll repeat. Next note, next note, and so forth. Once you extract the logic, the rest is the same. So it's in groups of threes, so we'll have one, two, three, one, two, that third string, fifth fret. We're not going to continue throughout. You can if you want to. But you don't have to. And that's not what that lick says. That lick ends on the um, second half of the second measure, or second bar. If we try this in context, over our loop. So remember, three notes per beat. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, four. Yep, I think I can do a little too much. I'll try it again one more time. One, two, three. down. It doesn't have to be three notes per beat. You can maybe just play one note per beat. Just to get used to the idea. Just to memorize those notes. And because that idea is extracted, these notes are extracted from just a minor pentatonic scale in a different position, combining several slides. That means that it's going to work on any minor pentatonic scale chord progression. And we're in A, and there's a backing track included. We'll try it over the backing track. This is a reggae type of thing. So I've got it on my phone. We'll, we'll play it and see what it sounds like. So in essence, over this track, any of the notes from the minor pentatonic scale in A are going to work. We'll very verify that. Just playing notes from that pentatonic scale. Now 
let's try that lick. That's our beat. Three notes per beat. That's how it sounds like. And it works. Because I'm matching the, the key of the track. And that's what music is, matching musical elements together. It's using the musical alphabet that fits the alphabet that was used to build these chords. That's what we're doing. That was like number one. Let's take a look at number two this time. And this time we're gonna break a little bit from the pure sliding position. We're gonna try to combine several ones together. And if you, if we start looking at the rhythm, it's a little different. It's no, no longer threes, but fours. So four note per beat. This is our beat. I have four notes per beat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And we're starting in the first position, the first slice of the fretboard. That was session number one, four or uh, five weeks ago. So you can go back and watch that. Quick reminder of that position if you're an A. There are two notes per string, two notes per string for all these standard positions. You're starting with A on the sixth string, fifth fret, and that'll be frets five, eight, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven again, five, eight, and five, eight. So we're starting in that first slice, and the first four notes are descending that minor pentatonic scale, but from the second string. So second string, we have frets eight, five, third string, seven, five. And that little um, hat between the first two notes, that's a pull off. Pull off is in essence, you're not plucking each note with your pick, just plucking the first one and your uh, finger you're lifting from, you're coming from, is doing the pluck, almost like it's acting like a little pick. That's what that sign is. So we've got eight, five, seven, five. We're, the next four notes are uh, fourth string, seventh fret. So, so far we're just pure first position minor pentatonic. Then we're ascending on the third string, frets five, seven. And then we're sliding. That's part of, of that sliding position. So we're combining position one with that slide. And then we're almost done. We are on the third group of four notes. We've got uh, second string, fret, fret eight. Back to the third string, fret nine. Back to the second string, eight. 10, and we're ending on the first string, eighth fret. So slowly, it'll be something like this. One more time. In context, over this loop, so that's our tempo. That's four notes per beat. One, two, three, four. Play it one more time. Yep, kind of messed that up. Try it one more time. One more time. That was lake number two. Hey, Dave, before we move on to the next one, do yeah. you, somebody's asking, and I can't remember because we did this so long ago, if the uh, reggae track, do you practice over that in the guided practice? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, pretty sure I do. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I thought. It has but been I've a while. Been, yeah, it's been like three months, I think. I'm pretty sure that we do, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, let, me, let me talk real quick about those sessions if you're new. Um, each of the sessions that we're doing live comes with a pre-recorded practice guide, which I want you to use throughout the week. I'll remind you at the end of the session, but basically you just grab your guitar, 
just play the video and follow along the instructions. And it's just an easier way to practice what we're covering here. And each session has those. I'd recommend you use it maybe twice a week. And uh, that's what we were talking about, those practice guide sessions, which are available in the supplemental content of the lesson you're watching now. All right. Lick number three, which is the last one. And then I'll leave you with some exercises. Lick number three is a little more complex rhythmically, a little faster. There are six notes per beat this time. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. If that's a little hard to count, you can divide it in two. Instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Think of it like that. Takata, takata, takata. That'll be easier. Let's see what we have as far as the notes. We're going to study the first six notes. We're starting on fret number 10 of the first string. And then uh, we're going down to fret number 8. So 10, 8. On the next string, we have 10, back to 8, and back to 10. That's six notes. One, two, three, four, five. Actually, that's five. And six is on the eighth fret. As we're starting to memorize these, you should have some kind of feel for logical repetition that's going on. If I just play the lick, you'll hear it. hear that there's a logic there that's repeating the logic is descend three notes and then descend three notes again but this time from the second note I'm just descending three notes and that's the full thing and then it's just a matter of knowing which position we're using, and we're using that slide position. And that's our lick. So if you take it slowly, one note at a time, memorizing that, your fingers eventually are going to know exactly what to do because there is a repetition there. And your ear is gonna guide you as far as which notes to hit. If you're playing this, Well, you kind of hear there's something a little off there because it doesn't fit what we've been working on, what your ear should be used to playing by now. Let's try to play that lick on, the, on this track. So that's our tempo, six notes per beat. The, the rhythm is something like this. Try to read at the same time, I'm not a really good reader. There we go. If that's too fast, slow it down by half. Instead of six notes, do it three. So if that's our, our tempo. Try that over the track that is included for you. It's good to try it on different styles of music as long as the as the chord progression is from the same key. That's our beat. That's six notes. But if 
must, if I half it, three notes per beat, it still works. And it still creates a, an idea that makes sense. forth. All right. I went a little fast for that last lick because I want to tell you about how to use these licks. I don't want you to get caught up in, man, that's too fast, or I can't memorize this. This is too difficult. It doesn't have to be. If you're learning this lick note per note, what it will do is basically you just kind of learn how to imitate exactly what was written on a piece of paper. And that's okay, but that's not really expressing an idea musically. It's not really telling your story. These licks are meant to be starting points, exercises, or words. I like to see licks as words that you read first and you learn how they're spelled. But then there's a lot of different ways to saying that word. For example, if I take just these few notes... Let's do, um, let's go back to that sliding position. Let's say that I have, um, I'm just gonna ascend that position. That would be a lick. Just playing the position that we learned today. So let's say that this is a lick. That's how it's written. This is our tempo. That's how it was written, but that's not necessarily how I'm going to say it. If I read the, let's say that that word means um, mountain, and you're learning the word mountain, but you're learning it in a context of very nostalgic. You're reading a story, and uh, the, the storyteller is nostalgic. He remembers growing up there was a mountain. And so when he says the word mountain, He's like, oh, I remember those mountains, mountains. It's said like that, mountains. And if you're uh, talking about like re something really upbeat, oh man, I can't wait to go to the, and you use that same intonation for that word, oh man, I can't wait to go to the mountains. Doesn't work, right? That's how licks are. If you're just memorizing that lick note per note as it's written on the paper, then you're not adding any feeling to it. You're not using it properly. So if one lick is too hard for you, like that one, that last one, just transform it into something that fits your needs, your emotional needs at the time of the story. So if this is the mood of the song, that song, that mood is very different from that one, a little happier. Same scale, but it sounds very different though. And so I want you to take a lick and apply it to the context, to the music context you're in. Match the emotions that are given to you by the track. So on this, I, I probably wouldn't play that lick like it is written. It fits harmonically, but the emotions don't really match. So take it and make something out of it. That matches better maybe than, than that. Same word, but said with can use all the things that you would use emotionally too. When I'm speaking to you, I've got my own intonation, my own tone, my own speech impediment, my own whatever it is, my own accent that makes me me. And that's, that's how licks should work really. Make it your own 
and uh, ask yourself, how do I, can I play this word, this lick, um, with this emotion tied to it? Let's say I'm happy. How would I say that? Maybe you'd be a little upbeat. Maybe you would attack the notes a little bit harder. All the notes are, are really sounding loud and clear and you're hearing everything. Whereas if you're just waking up, didn't get your coffee yet, it maybe wouldn't sound like that. Maybe it would sound like... It would sound different. It's the same word, but said differently. So that's how I want you to take these. Don't get caught on repeating exactly what was said on the paper or what you learned in a song. You don't have to play it exactly. Uh, that's what I had for you. I want to encourage you to go through these practice sessions, and I'm going to open it up. I don't know if we have any questions. Oh, we have lots of questions. Oh, okay. Um, so <clears throat> before we get into the questions, I just wanted to let everyone know we are doing something sort of new. <clears throat> Pardon me. Got some allergies here. On the forum now, there is a new section under the general heading called Live Session Discussions. And underneath that, throughout the whole week, if you're watching one of the archives and you have a question about one of the old sessions that you want us to answer, you know, um, post it there and we will ask it during the next video session. So that way, if you can't make a session live, you have the ability to ask some questions still and get them answered by Dave instead of me or Jason on the forum. Um, so... We have a couple of those coming up. I just wanted to let everybody know. Um, but anyway, we will get on the questions. This first one is from MS Blues Man. And I think it was in regards to the first lick. And he was asking if you should use alternate picking or downstrokes. Yeah. Um, there's no should, really, but I'll tell you what I did. I used alternate picking. But it doesn't matter what you use, whatever's comfortable. I like alternate picking for this because there's a consistency in the way these notes are organized, and there's a consistency in the alternate picking too. And if you can keep that, that frees your mind to focus on the music because these are kind of automatic. But there's no should. It doesn't matter. The listener is not going to hear whether it's down or up. So it doesn't matter. Thank you, good sir. Axe 2 asks, how do you turn the pentatonic scale into the Dorian mode? Is it adding the second and the sixth? Yeah, exactly. Um, any pentatonic scale can be turned into a mode by adding those missing notes. So you're referring to a minor mode, therefore minor pentatonic, and you're going to add some form of second and some form of sixth because those are the missing notes in there. Pentatonic is root, third, fifth, or sorry, root, third, fourth, fifth, seventh. There's no second, there's no sixth. So by adding one of these, you will make a complete minor mode. And the same goes with the major modes. But yeah, for Dorian, you add second and sixth. Good question. Excellent. Southern Cash says, I have been creating a lot of my own loops using full chords. I noticed you created the loop using bass notes. Can you give details on the notes you used and the beats you put them on? Or I'm assuming he'd also be pretty hip to some advice just on yeah. how to do that in, the, in general. Yeah. Um, usually when I create loops, I, I try to go simplistic. And most of the time with this pedal, I start with the bass. And I usually, because the purpose of these loops is to practice a lick or, or well, a, a short loop and not necessarily phrasing in terms of uh, a bunch of different chords, what I like to do is keep the bass constant. So here we're in A minor pentatonic. So what I did is think of my A minor pentatonic first position. And most of the time, I just play that root and play the some kind of well. Actually, forget what <laughs> forget what I was saying. Sorry. Yeah, I just go off of the minor pentatonic scale to make my bass thing. I'm gonna delete that loop and we'll try something. Uh, so that's my minor pentatonic scale. That could be a loop. that, I th I'm thinking to myself, 
not necessarily in terms of chords, but in terms of, again, minor pentatonic, but I'm gonna think, since this is bass, I'm gonna think a higher version of that. So let's take this position, for example. From that, I'm gonna take one note per string. I'm not thinking of which ones, it doesn't matter. And that played all together, that'll be a chord. And that's my loop. I just took the minor pentatonic in different areas of the fretboard. That created my loop. Because the loop is extracted from the pentatonic, anything I throw at it is going to work. So to answer your question, I can't remember the question, but I start with the bass and not full chords, just extract a few notes from the scale I'm working with and try to make it work like that. But less is usually more because you have more space to add things to it. I believe that did pretty good. Um, if there is any other anything else you'd like addressed, let us know, Southern Cash, and we will get all back up in your grill in a good way. <laughs> um, okay, so this question's almost the same, so I don't know if you just want to say the last question answered it, but I figured I'd ask it anyway. He says, so what's the secret to making tight loops? Tight, brah. Mine ain't. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of similar, but I'd say, um, and I'm still working on it too. But subdivisions. So when I'm when I'm playing that, oops, I deleted it. But when I'm playing this, like if this was my starting loop, I'm not thinking this, which is the the beat. In my mind, I'm not thinking this because that. Too much space between each between each uh, uh, tick. Instead of thinking of that, I'm thinking of subdivisions. Usually it's fours. That's what I'm thinking. Subdivisions is going to help you be more precise. Plus. If you're thinking taka taka and you hit a note accidentally, you're still in that taka taka taka, and that note is gonna add a little rhythm dimension. Taka taka taka. Let's try something in F sharp. And I was thinking. Stop. Anyways, yeah, subdivision is what you want instead of just a beat. Sweet. Let us know if you'd like to know anything else. Sir Gregory, I will move on. Um, so as I can see, that's all the questions we have from the chat right now. So we're going to move on to the forum questions, and we probably will generally do these last since the person is likely not here. Um, this is a long one. Jay Polito <laughs> says, I am currently in lesson three of this archive, but I cannot play the assigned licks to learn at the speed that David plays them at. So I'm practicing at the current speed I can do so that it sounds clean and correct. The timing is right, but I cannot keep up the speed at which David plays them. How long do I stay in lesson three before moving on to lesson four? Considering that even though I know the licks, my speed is not up to David's speed yet. Oh, yeah. Um, and this goes for any lesson. Definitely move on to the next, even if you did, did not master the previous one. It doesn't matter because these are built to, like, I'm really taking, I'm trying to take time to remind you of the previous one. And I know that this is, even though it's a Nate session thing, you might not master a piece of this, and that's okay. That's really okay. Um, so don't get too caught up on the speed thing. Mostly what I want you to get out of, it, of this is understanding how to make sense of the fretboard and the rest will follow. Even if it's in a few years, that's completely okay. So don't worry about it too much. 
Rock on. Right, here's yeah. another long one, and it feels like awkward to read these out loud, but that's kind of the way we've done <laughs> no, it. Oh, that's good. People so like just, it. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm sure people love hearing my nasal intonation. I love it, them. too. I don't have to read that way. That's okay. Good. Well, you still read it, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, this is from Al. I don't know if it's Al Elms or Al Elms, but this person isn't here to correct me, so I guess I'm in the free. Is there a method to make up a good lick? I'm practicing the licks in the course, and they go together well. I try a few of my homegrown ones, and let's just say they need some more fertilizer. <laughs> oh, yeah. For example, I'm putting together a jazzy lead over Bobby Hebb's song, Sunny. I have the basic rhythm and figured out the notes to the song, but I'm having a hard time putting together some licks so it doesn't sound like I'm in a middle school band playing sheet music. <laughs> yup. Um, oh, well, Al Elms is here. I, okay, it's Al Elms. What I would suggest is um, to... I think it probably sounds not very good because of the uh, the comfort that you have with your instrument. Like this probably still feels like something a little foreign, and that's normal. It is kind of it's more foreign than your voice. So what I would really encourage you to do is, and my best solos were written like that, is to really literally put the guitar down. Because even if you decide not to play at some point or another, you're gonna play. You're going to start playing and just really put it down and start imagining something over the backing track you're working on. So if it's sunny, I don't have it here, but if it's the reggae thing, you just really start singing over. Not right away, but first you let the backing track almost tell you what it needs. Okay. Um, da -da 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 -ba -ba. It works great. Now, so we have that idea. That's a great lick that came from inside, just singing. Now you try to find it. There it is. You found the notes. And try to really add to that what you were singing. Uh, maybe a note was a little lower in volume. Ba -da 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 -ba 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 -da Try to reproduce that. And then try it over this. Now I bet your licks automatically are going to sound super musical. So that's not what I play. It works really good. I bet a lick like that, you're probably going to remember it a lot more than if I were to play um, something very guitar-like, which is almost like automatic playing. It, it, this type of lick is not generated from inside. It's generated just by the fingers knowing the positions. kind of doing their own thing and that's okay that has its place but I bet you still remember something like that so that's my advice put the guitar down and sing over the track and you'll be amazed at the ideas how musical they are how simple probably but that that's great you'll probably remember them that is all the questions we have for today my good man great um, thanks so much, everyone. Next week, you're gonna, your mind is going to be blown away because I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> We're going to continue exploring the minor fitotonic scale. Uh, check out the pre-recorded practice guide. It's about, I can't remember, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. So set aside some time and grab your guitar and watch the video. This one is 40 minutes. 40 minutes, yep. okay. So... Try, try to run it once this week. More is good, but try to do it once. And I'll see you next Monday, same time, same place on jamplay.com. And leave your questions, like Jeff said, on the thing. On the forum, yeah. We, uh, so it, it's just under the, the general section of forums, and it's called Live Session Discussions. 
and there will be a thread in there called melodic or not melodic magic pentatonic mastery and yeah post any questions you have in there yeah thanks so much everyone see you next week